thank you so much for joining today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we're excited to present uh, to you on uh, the topic of migrating uh, legacy VDI to AWS Cloud Native Services. Uh, it's a really exciting time uh, for us here at AWS uh, in the EUC group because uh, there's a lot going on. Um, some of you may have attended our Innovation Day last week uh, that was headed up by, by the services team and Munir, Mirza, um, and uh, lots of great announcements and, and, and uh, new capabilities coming around. So we thought it was just a perfect time to also uh, present uh, to everybody uh, about some of the business benefits uh, of what it is that we do here. So I'm excited to be presenting alongside of my colleague Yvonne uh, and our partner George. Uh, I'm going to give them a chance to uh, introduce themselves in a second. But before we do that, let's just uh, go through and talk to you about the agenda. So, of course, we're going to talk about VDI modernization and what that means from a holistic perspective, what the drivers are. Uh, and there are numerous ones. There obviously are technical drivers, uh, but there are also uh, many business drivers. And that's really what we're going to focus on here today. Um, and then we are actually going to have uh, Yvonne talk to us about some of the specific economics and, and TCO involved. Uh, and she's the leading expert on our team. Uh, she's the one who did uh, some incredible work with uh, Forrester uh, and their total economic impact uh, um, program. And, and she'll talk to you all about that and get you know, pretty deep into some numbers. Uh, we're also super excited to talk to you about Globe Telecom. Uh, we have uh, a, a number of telecom uh, clients um, on today, and Globe is just in a, a fantastic story that we're very excited to share uh, with you guys because it's really all about customer obsession for us here at AWS. Then we'll uh, switch gears just slightly. We'll have uh, George introduce Cloudhesive which is the company that he works for, a partner of ours, uh, tell you a little bit about the firm, and then also really focus on how it is that Cloudhesive and other EUC competency partners uh, can help you in your migration journey. And that's at the end of the day why we're here. It's great to talk about the benefits, it's important to understand them so you can position them properly within your organization, but then if you actually really wanna get started, which we hope you will, uh, it's critically important to you that you understand what some of the best practices and, and recommended next steps are. So we'll cover those as well. So again, I'm Jeff. I work as a global sales specialist on our EUC team covering uh, global accounts, uh, primarily in the telco and healthcare and life sciences space. Uh, I've been at AWS just under a year. Uh, but I've been doing EUC my entire career, uh, having worked for a number of the leaders uh, in on-prem VDI, a number of startups, uh, some of which are, uh, you know, are sort of lore now. Uh, Softricity is one, Desktone is the other. Uh, Desktone is actually uh, sort of famous for being the company that gets credit uh, for officially creating the DAS or desktop as a service model. Um, and it's just great to be here, uh, you know, continuing the journey, uh, um, you know, working with EUC services here at AWS. Yvonne? Hey, all right. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, yes, my name is Yvonne Dresser, and I'm with the End User Computing Go to Market team. I've been uh, with AWS just about three years, uh, and I'm the subject matter expert for. Uh, business value and cost optimization for, for VDI and our DAS services. And uh, yeah, just like Jeff, I've also been in this space for a while and very happy to be on this call today. Fantastic. Great. George? All right. Uh, yeah, great to be here. Excited to talk about this. Uh, my name is George Rodriguez and I work for Cloudhesive. We're an AWS Premier partner. I've been working for them for about the last five years. And previous to that, for the better part of a decade, I worked with a lot of on-prem um, web servers, uh, operational type roles. So this is 
really key, really excited to talk about this. Fantastic. Great to have you here and represent the partner voice. Uh, you know, it's, it's always good to bring in different perspectives and we really appreciate your time. So just to level set very quickly, this is not a webinar about um, technology related to DAS and VDI and capabilities and, and so on and so forth. But we did want to make sure that everyone, you know, knows that they're in the right place, so to speak, you know, kind of like a, a you are here on the on the mall map. So we are talking about, uh, you know, VDI as sort of the legacy, uh, you know, uh, implementation of the solution on-prem VDI, um, and then sort of the, the, the for, forward-looking solution being referred to as DAS or it's sort of cloud-based uh, uh, VDI. And uh, so for those of you who are familiar, we assume everyone knows that we're talking about you know, the server-based computing where you're actually running a virtualized instance of a Windows client OS, or in certain cases, multi-session operating system that's running in uh, either your data center or in the cloud, and users are accessing that through a client uh, using uh, some sort of remoting protocol. Um, so it's a very well understood, uh, widely deployed model. I mean, I started deploying this technology myself in the late 90s, which is kind of scary to think about. But uh, it's, again, you know, something that, that I think most people understand pretty well. Um, and it does have certain inherent benefits, you know, that we'll talk about in the fact that, you know, you've got your data running, your applications running in, in a data center or in a, in a hyperscale data center, and the only thing that is being sent down to the user, broadcast to the user, are uh, keyboard mouse clicks. Uh, so there is absolutely no application workload or data that is put on the endpoint. In terms of what AWS does in this arena, we now actually have built out a portfolio, which is really exciting. It's one of the reasons I joined. Um, for those of you who have been tracking us, you know, workspaces, uh, which is our persistent Windows desktop offering uh, that I'll talk just a bit about here that, you know, was first released in 2014. So uh, it's been in market now for eight years, uh, which is amazing. Um, and we have added incremental services uh, to provide uh, for different use cases. Uh, so Workspaces is sort of the flagship. That's, I think, what people talk about the most. Again, that's a fully persistent um, Windows or Linux uh, uh, desktop uh, operate or you know uh, workspace, if you will. It could be a desktop OS. It could be a server OS that that runs in our cloud uh, and that your users access. Uh, the main sort of um, takeaway is that that instance or those instances are dedicated to specific users. They always come back to them. Uh, those instances can be left running all the time in scenarios where users can't afford, you know, any sort of, you know, re reconnect time. We also do have some optimization technology where those instances can be uh, shut off or powered down and then sort of rehydrated when the users come and you, and you can save money that way. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, perhaps at the end. So that's really sort of a workspace. It's, it is your corporate it's environment for your users but it's running uh, in, in the Amazon cloud. Uh, we also introduced uh, AppStream 2.0 a couple of years ago, and that's really more about publishing uh, uh, applications or desktops. Uh, and the difference there is that those are non-persistent, which means that every time the user uh, or a set of users connects to, the, to their instance, um, they're getting a fresh um, uh, copy of that instance built from a golden image, uh, we don't save state uh, natively within the solution. Uh, and so that's really a lower cost option, generally speaking, um, for task-based workers, uh, you know, very popular with call centers uh, and other environments uh, where, you know, maybe a shop floor where you just really want to deliver a, a, an application or two in, in sort of a seamless window mode, or perhaps a couple applications in a full desktop mode. Uh, but there's no need to, again, persist the state. And every time the users start, they get a fresh copy. Uh, about a year ago, we, we um, announced a, a service called Workspaces Web, which is a derivative 
of uh, AppStream 2.0, essentially a browser delivered via uh, AppStream, a Chrome browser. Um, some of you may be familiar with, with browser isolation technology. That's really the net result of what you get from Workspaces Web. So if you're delivering SaaS applications or browser-based applications uh, that can be delivered through Chrome, you can manage that. Uh, those instances running on our cloud, you get all the benefits that we talked about of, you know, no data resident on the endpoint. Um, you also get a ton of uh, management capabilities and can set policy for what users can and cannot do in those Chrome instances. Uh, and so that's a really uh, cool solution that's, you know, rounded out the portfolio and, uh, and gathering a lot of steam. Uh, obviously, as uh, people move uh, more towards browser-based applications. So, drivers for modernizing our VDI. I guess I should have also mentioned, I see that there's a question here that came up. Looks like uh, Yvonne is on it. But if you do have questions, don't be shy. Please use the uh, Q&A panel. Uh, and while I'm presenting, Yvonne will, will uh, do her best to answer your questions. Um, and while she's presenting, I will do the same. So, um, why should you, or, or why are customers, uh, you know, looking to modernize their VDI? Uh, I guess the best way to kick off this section is really to quote, uh, or to take a data point here from Gartner, um, which uh, produces, obviously, a lot of research around you know VDI and DAS, uh, and in their last market guide for for desktop as a service, which I think was published last year, they're predicting that by 2024, which is only two years away now, um, or not even you know, less than that, 80% uh, of all virtual desktops will be delivered through a desktop as a service, uh, a cloud desktop as a service offering. Um, so obviously, you know, tremendous momentum around. Moving from on-prem to the cloud, we're seeing it within EUC, um, and it's critically important that companies and organizations who are still heavily dependent on VDI on-prem get a handle on what's involved, what the benefits are technically from a business perspective, and then as we'll talk about with George at the end, what you can start doing now to really get your journey going uh, and and to uh, and start you know really diving deep. So drivers, clearly aged infrastructure requires new capital. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, falling behind on VDI software upgrades, a lot of on-prem uh, VDI uh, solutions. Um, you know, the vendors who produce them have been moving to, trying to move or moving to cloud-based solutions. The on-prem uh, or legacy versions don't get as much love. Um, and, you know, so, you know, it, it's it's easy to fall behind. It's also easy to fall behind because it's, you know, very sort of fragile infrastructure and, you know, large organizations, large enterprises don't like to, you know, tweak or, you know, change things that are working. And then the next thing you know, you're two versions behind and, you know, then there are potentially security issues and so on and so forth. You know, you know, part and parcel of that, IP, IT operations burden keeps growing. You know, so now people are managing stuff that's running in, you know, AWS cloud, other clouds, still keeping their on-prem going. There's a lot of balls in the air, lots to juggle. Um, and then something that's really important is, you know, struggling with the right amount of capacity, especially for customers who have seasonal businesses and, and reasons that they may burst up in number of desktops or users and then, you know, down for maybe for tax season or for other purposes and very, very hard to manage that in a cost-effective way using um, on-prem uh, technology. So just a little plug here for an article that I, I wrote uh, maybe about eight weeks ago on LinkedIn about aged infrastructure. Um, and what's so interesting about this topic is I mean, we've been talking about it for a long time. Uh, and I think, you know, with the whole sort of supply chain issue because of the pandemic, I think what we see is that um, uh, uh, customers are, you know, sort of, or the press is sort of very heavily focused on um, the endpoint, you know, BYOD, aging laptops, supply chain, can't get chips, you know, can't, no availability of, of, of desktops and laptops and so on and so forth. 
What I'm seeing that's really sort of the nuance here that's critically important is that on-prem VDI requires hardware. Uh, Hyper converts infrastructure normally when it's running within enterprise data centers. And even more so than getting laptops and desktops or thin clients uh, has been the struggle to provision uh, for customers to get access to uh, hyper-converged infrastructure. And we're hearing lead times now that are you know, well into six months, certain vendors into a year. Um, and so very, very difficult to, you know, to be able to work and to, you know, to plan around those kinds of, that kind of uncertainty. Uh, and so um, that's one of the benefits that we'll talk about. Maybe I'll just take a pause here and let uh, George maybe pipe in uh, with some thoughts around what, what you're seeing, you know, with respect to your customers and you know, some of the drivers for, for why they're considering, uh, considering moving to the cloud. Yeah, absolutely. So one of our major enterprise customers, they are also operating an on-prem VDI and working with them, they have to manage software hardware, end user, security, et cetera, all these things that put a pretty big operational burden and it's the typical cloud model for why you don't wanna run something yourself. In, in essence, all the things I mentioned, they represent the value proposition in the cloud conversation. You're not managing all that, you're scaling up, scaling down, paying only for what you use. Uh, great example of that is using the workspaces cost optimizer. Because depending on folks' user profiles, you wouldn't have to have some workspaces always on. You determine break-even points where, for example, if folks are all using their systems for about 80 hours a month, you would have them on always on. Otherwise, you could work with auto stops. And the, the, the point of it is that AWS has technologies with the optimizer, and they have a lot of aggressive strategies to really drive value and help you get the price and performance balance that you need yeah no that, that that's great and, and great to have your perspective on that as well um so let's take a look here let me just get back to the screen sorry about uh some of the the vdi modernization options um so this is you know i think that the reasons are sort of you know clear why uh folks want want to move to to the cloud uh, I mean, one thing, a quick thing I'll add that I just remembered is, you know, this goes back to the core of um, Jeff Bezos's MIT lecture in 2006, when he talked about the fact, you know, everyone's still trying to figure out, like, you know, what is AWS? And Jeff sort of eloquently said, you know, we build muck so you don't have to, right? That really is what we're talking about here, uh, being able to leverage the, the, the scale and power of the AWS cloud. Um, but in a way where you don't have to, um, uh, as a customer, you know, manage the muck, if you will. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, in, in this slide specifically. Um, so when, when we talk about what the options are in terms of, you know, models to move to, we generally see three. And, and we'll start actually from the right. Uh, and, and move towards the left. So first, you know, we saw a wave maybe starting about five years ago, I want to say, where it really picked up, where folks were rehosting on-prem VDI on public cloud, right? So that's your classic lift and shift, right? I'm using XYZ vendors, server-based computing platform, I've been using it forever. My management's telling me I have to move to the cloud, our data centers are closing. And so what people thought was the easiest to do, and we were actually preaching a lot of this at desktop back in 2008, was you just move what you have into the cloud, right? Sounds good on paper, much more complex uh, in, in reality. Uh, and so, you know, what I think people found was that still being responsible for the storage and the host administration and, and really that, that a VDI control plane uh, and, and management console and administration that was not designed with cloud in mind. It was designed around on-prem data centers. Um, it just didn't, it, it doesn't really work, right? And so I think most of the, of the larger customers that I've engaged with who looked at this, you know, maybe some have, have done small migrations but it's not really sort of a long-term solution. It could be a good first step 
And I don't want to say it's 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 a, it's off the table, but you know when you look out sort of you know for a, a, a three year five year you know strategy plan, this is probably just phase one, if if it's a phase at all. Uh, then what we saw after that actually was you know people were starting to look at what we were doing with workspaces. Uh, again, that the space was really becoming coming into its own. Um, and so a number of um, uh, you know, cloud service providers offering what we sort of term as VDI IaaS, where they started you know, building cloud native control planes and administration and, and so on and so forth. So you weren't sort of you know, bearing the full technical debt of taking something that was completely built for on-prem and moving it into the cloud and then having all kinds of weird issues to, to iron out. However, uh, and this still is to today, you know, the way we differentiate today uh, uh, from the competition, there's still a, a lot of moving parts that you need to actually manage within uh, those cloud providers infrastructure, uh, specifically around managing hosts, around managing storage, and so on and so forth. So that leads us to what we, you know, believe is the ultimate sort of endpoint, uh, if you will. Sorry about, about the pun. Uh, which is cloud native uh, managed services. And that's really the, the design point and the, and the frame that we use to build out workspaces, AppStream 2.0, um, workspaces web and, and uh, additional solutions we'll be bringing to market. And, and that is, you know, the, the best way I've sort of heard people talk about this, because it's very nuanced and it's hard to say it's you know, sort of a fully managed service, it's a partially managed service. What does that mean? Um, I like to think of this as platform as a service for, for end user computing. And, and what that means is that all you have to bring as a customer is, um, are, are your images, your, your desktop images, your server images, uh, and your, and your directory services or active directory. We provide everything else for you. Uh, you know, it's not just a management and control plane, but it's also load balancing and an inherent level of, of uh, redundancy uh, and really getting you out of the business of figuring out how to configure uh, all of those bottom layers. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Not sure if uh, either Yvonne or uh, uh, George you want to you know, sort of provide some color here. I know, again, this is always a little bit tricky. Um, but, um, but hopefully I explained it in a way that made sense. Yep. Yep. Okay. So why migrate to e AWS EUC managed services specifically? Again, I think we really talked about this, uh, covered most of the stuff. Uh, I think the one key point, a few key points here. First is it's not all about the money. Right, that was something you know very heavily focused back in the early days of DAS, uh, where you know it's like, oh, you'll save money, and you know we quickly, uh, as a community, um, as as vendors, realized that was not the case. Um, so I would say you know agility is critically important. You know it's not only providing agility for the business, but it's also providing agility for the IT. Uh, team who has to manage this stuff, uh, and and obviously that the the amount of work that they have to do directly impacts lead times and provisioning, which impacts the business. So those are are you know sort of fully uh, intertwined. Uh, we do see some cost savings. Uh, I'm not going to uh, steal Yvonne's thunder. Uh, she's going to talk to you about that um, in just a moment here. Uh, and I would also call out sort of, you know, business risk and business continuity. Um, and this is something I really plan on actually blogging on, uh, blogging about for, for uh, the rest of the year, which I think is a critical, you know, topic, which is workspace continuity, right? The fact that we have seen and we have lived through this pandemic and all of this change, and it's critically important to have workspaces available um, for your end users when they need to get their work done, in, no matter what's going on uh, economically uh, or within the world. Um, and there are some major benefits, uh, which some of which we've touched on, that we provide uh, for that through our managed services. But I digress, and uh, I will now 
let um, Yvonne come in here and talk to you specifically about how our solutions um, map up uh, uh, versus uh, traditional on-prem BDI costs. All right, so great segue. Uh, Jeff, uh, you know, you shared some really great information around the key top line and bottom line benefits of AWS EUC services. So now let's go uh, click down and discuss this on a more practical level. And so we, you know, when you consider on-prem VDI costs, there really are four buckets, right? And these may already be familiar to you, but the first uh, is the, in the largest bucket is the compute hardware. And this includes things like the server maintenance. Uh, and this also includes things like racks, power and cooling, and data center facility space. And so what we've been seeing is this bucket accounts for roughly 50 plus percent of the on-prem uh, VDI solution costs. And then um, this is followed by software, which is around 30% of the total cost and includes not only the VDI software, but also the Microsoft and the VMware vSphere licensing. And then if you're still looking at this chart, the storage and the networking buckets are a smaller percentage at around 10% each. And so um, what I'd like to do now is show you a VDI migration to AWS EUC TCO case study to illustrate for you where the potential savings and the top line business value are reflected. So for this case study, uh, we have an organization which is a regional financial services firm and they have about 5,000 employees. Today they're running uh, on-prem VDI in their data center and they have been for a number of years. The two primary user groups uh, being supported are around 500 hybrid work employees across the organization, and they come from various departments. And then there's also another 250 end users supported in the company's contact center. And their work week is a typical eight by five schedule. The organization refreshes their hardware every four years, and they're due now for a refresh, which has generated that compelling event to explore an alternative DAS solution. And so looking at this slide, starting from the left, currently the organization is spending about 335,000 annually. And with a hardware refresh, that comes out to about 1.3 million over three years. And then when you break down that 1.3 million cost, you'll see that over half of it comes from compute or the server hardware, which includes server operations and data center services. Uh, the software is a significant cost as well and the storage and the networking hardware will also be replaced and there's ongoing operations costs that are going to be associated with the solution which are included across the, the four cost buckets and then when you move to the right side of the slide the total three-year cost to run the equivalent of that on-prem vdi solution is much less at just 942,000 or or 314k annually uh, this figure is based on migrating to Amazon's AppStream service and delivering non-persistent desktops. And then we've also added in uh, some S3 object storage. This is for uh, persisting that user personalization layer. And that includes things such as the user settings and the user file data. And then there's another 10% to cover the cost of AWS Enterprise Support. And so if you take a look at the difference between these two figures, on-prem versus AWS, it's about 29% over three years, which is pretty significant. And so um, uh, as, as Jeff talked about at the beginning of this presentation, there is definitely more to cloud value than just TCO. It's also about other top line value. And so to prove this out for AWS EUC services, we commissioned Forrester Consulting to conduct a total economic impact study to examine the potential return on investment organizations may realize by de uh, deploying AWS end user computing services. Um, and this includes workspaces and AppStream. And so the objective of the study was to provide readers with a framework to help them evaluate the potential financial impact of AWS EUC uh, on their organization from a benefits, a costs, and a risks perspective. And so Forrester approached this project by interviewing six decision makers from four organizations with experiences using AWS EUC services. And then Forrester aggregated the interviewees experiences and data and combined those results into a single composite organization. 
Uh, the composite organization has about 5,000 employees. About 50% of the users are on AWS EUC, and they hire about 1,000 contractors per year that are also on AWS EUC. The Composites IT organization also has about 15 full-time equivalent engineers and admins supporting all of end-user computing, and that includes the traditional and laptop environments as well as the BDI. And so based on that data collected from the customer interviews and then modeled to this composite customer, the following economic value was calculated and showed that the biggest benefit was increased profit from the ability of the organization to be more agile. And a lot of this came from being able to quickly turn on workspaces and AppStream during the COVID pandemic. This was just to maintain company productivity and also avoid losing business uh, from having to shut down. It was also about being able to acquire new business from competitors who had to shut down because they didn't have the right technology to remain open. Um, some of the other business benefits included uh, faster time to productivity, and this was due to faster onboarding, um, which was the second highest business benefit. So the AWS customers that we interviewed said that provisioning workspaces and AppStream 2.0 accounts, as opposed to having to provide the physical laptops to new hires, significantly shortened the onboarding process for employees and contractors. And so this meant that uh, workers could be productive sooner. And then uh, TCO savings from onboarding uh, or introducing BYOD was a third business benefit. So the interview decision makers said that having AWS EUC services meant that they could introduce a BYOD model and employees and contractors could choose um, to use their own personal devices. So this means that organizations could reduce, if not completely eliminate the practice of purchasing physical laptops and desktops, you know, provisioning them and then shipping them to their employees and their contractors. Um, and then a fourth business benefit was around increased IT staff productivity. And this is just from the automation capabilities of using a fully managed service from AWS. So the AWS customers that we, we interviewed noted that the fully managed service automated a lot of the tasks that they previously had to do uh, manually. Uh, this translated into recaptured time of the IT uh, team's uh, schedules that could be reallocated to other IT projects. And in fact, one customer that we interviewed said that just um, you know, having not have to do the infrastructure maintenance, the security patching, uh, saved them 25% of their time, uh, for example. So this is just some of the, uh, the key top line and bottom line business benefits of using Amazon's uh, EUC services. So I, I hope this is informational to you. And what I'm going to do now, if there's no questions, is I'm going to pass it back to Jeff, who's going to continue the conversation. Awesome. Thanks so much, Yvonne. I mean, again, I think it's, you know, this is really the data and, and, uh, and the dollars behind, you know, so much of what we talk about, it, it, you know, packed in here is the conversation around the, the lead times for, um, for on-prem hardware, right? Not only the cost, but, you know, it used to be one thing, you know, you'd have to go, you know, and, and worry about, uh, you know, getting a budget from your boss if you were, if you were the VDI person, uh, the director or the VP responsible. Now you have to get approval and you also then have to wait, right? And so that's just, uh, you know, becoming so untenable. Um, so that, that's one piece, you know, talked about workspace, uh, or sort of implied about workspace continuity, the fact, again, that, you know, people can be productive and it's really on us uh, as AWS to, uh, you know, make sure that the underlying infrastructure is there for, for you and for you, your users. Um, and then a very sort of interesting piece, which we'll touch on a little bit here, which was the last piece about increased productivity from automation, um, you know, the fact that uh, AWS infrastructure and our cloud infrastructure is programmatic, I don't think a lot of people realize what you can do uh, with that power on the EUC side. Uh, and, you know, again, we've talked about, you know, sort of shutting down workspaces and, you know, and powering them up. And, uh, but there's a lot that you can do around provisioning. Uh, I know George is going to touch on that a little bit. Um, and we're, you know, uh, you know, we just announced Workspace's core uh, uh, during the Innovation Day, which is about making 
public a set of APIs for doing just that to integrate with you know provisioning systems, ITSM systems, you know customers who use ServiceNow as an example. You have a whole process for onboarding users. Our infrastructure can plug into that, and the more that you automate, as with anything else in IT, the lower the cost, less error prone things are. So um, this was great. Thank you so much for for sharing it. Um, and uh, let's now talk a little bit about uh, another customer. This time with with uh, an actual uh, a logo that we can share and that we're very proud of. This is. Uh, Globe uh, Telecom uh, in the Philippines, and uh, they um, they are a, uh, a leading full service telecom company uh, that offers mobile, fixed broadband, uh, and other managed services. They also have uh, major interests in uh, in different tech areas, fintech, uh, uh, venture capital for startups, uh, virtual healthcare. Um, and their story really is about uh, uh, dealing with uh, payment processing. Um, so uh, in the Philippines, as far as I understand, uh, and I think things have changed in the last couple of years due to the pandemic, but there was still pre-pandemic a lot of, uh, you know, in-person, manual, uh, sort of like, you know, go pay my bill, go to the store, uh, to, you know, take care of, of things that way. Uh, and then what happened was the, the, the pandemic hit um, and uh, Globe was no longer able to use business process outsourcing um, uh, and outsource contractors for managing those, uh, those payments and the scheduling uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the country, as you well know, uh, was on full national lockdown like so many um, and they were really in a bind uh, to figure out what to do. So luckily they had had some experience with RPA, which is a robotic processing, uh, a processing automation. Um, and uh, they uh, were able to leverage RPA technology in conjunction with workspaces to come up with a very uh, clever solution, which was that they installed uh, these RPA bots, which are basically you know, pieces of software that run and do screen scraping and uh, you know, in an automated fashion and, and are able to sort of run tasks in front of a, of a, of a, a client machine the way an end user would, uh, but fully programmatically. Um, so they deployed uh, ultimately 200 uh, workspaces with these RPA bots running. Uh, they immediately found, you know, tremendous benefit, which was the workspaces run you know, can run all the time. They're not desktops or, or laptops, which run into sort of overheating problems and power issues and, you know, all kinds of other issue, uh, issues of, of dealing with physical machines. Um, and so this really became um, the, the, the go-to solution for them. And their CIO was super happy because one of the things that he had mandated as part of their uh, their pillars of, of coming out of the pandemic was to increase the use of automation. Uh, and this helped them do so in a, in a super efficient uh, and cost-effective um, fashion. So the net result was they saved two months, they estimate in time versus an on-prem solution, no setup of machines, no validating machines. They also didn't have to check the sort of the physical uh, security of the machines. They also didn't have to have security software and licensing running on those laptops. Again, these, these machines were set up to act as bots to process payments. You don't want those machines just sort of hanging out in the office so anybody can sort of you know, walk up to it and see Joe Schmo's payment being processed, right? And so that was critically important uh, and really helped them to achieve their targets and scale up uh, with minimal cost and labor. So uh, again, I think you know these customer testimonials say it best. Uh, this is Red, uh, their director of work, workplace technology, uh, you know, talking about how the solution really worked for them um, and uh, really helped them achieve uh, these goals uh, uh, and and sort of the new challenges and goals that came out of dealing with the pandemic that really just did not you know work. Their their prior solution of doing this on you know, either manually with outsourcers or trying to do it with physical machines was just a non-starter. 
The other thing that makes this a great use case uh, or, or customer uh, success story is the fact that they uh, have expanded since then. So this is actually a story that's about, I don't know, maybe 12, 15 months old um, in terms of the RPA side of it. But since then, and since they saw so many benefits for, through that solution, they started investigating other use cases. And I'm happy to say that they've actually deployed uh, upwards of another 250, I believe, workspaces for 400 operators and, and uh, network engineers who are part of their, their network technical group. Uh, and these also include highly specialized employees uh, who are not uh, um, actually employees of Globe, they're contractors. Uh, and so, you know, really, really uh, awesome to see them, you know, not only find a specific use case, start small, get comfortable, solve a real business problem, but then be able to expand their usage of the port uh, of, of our solution set, uh, solution set and, and, and really apply it to other use cases. So, uh, so that's really, really good stuff. Okay. So now uh, we just have uh, a, a couple of more minutes left here. Um, I want to turn it over to George, who's going to talk to you a little bit about what Cloud Hesit does, leading into the last section to talk to you about what it is that we can bring as AWS and our partners will bring to you to help you start this journey um, should you choose to uh, take it. So George. Absolutely, thanks Jeff. So Cloud Hesip, we're an Amazon Premier partner and we're an MSP partner that we were founded in 2014 by veterans in the cloud technology space. So, you know, we help our customers by helping them transform through consulting, next gen, and we focus on managed services around operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization basically the pillars of the AWS well-architected framework. We do service customers in North America, South America, and beyond. We have our HQ in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and we also have offices in Norfolk, Virginia, Santiago, Chile, and Buenos Aires, Argentina. So adding on to you know, all the exciting stuff Jeff and Yvonne have been telling us, we have some value adds with our Centricity tool and Dexter. So with Centricity, you know, the first point, you have workspaces and app stream taking us out of the data center and into the cloud, which is a huge plus. But because of the way it's designed through the shared responsibility models, there may be certain security and operational considerations. Like for example, you'll be running your workspace, but information from the operating system, metrics on those, which by design, those are customer responsibilities. That's kind of where we add value add and help you monitor that. Centricity for us is wraps around this and it's key for large multi-geo and enterprise customers. It's gonna suck in all the config and workspace info, statistical info, OS info, which you can drill into, query and alert on it. And then on top of all that, we bundle managed security services onto it. So, and then if you look at Dexter from kind of the Connect space, it's like all of the above I just talked about for EUC, but for Amazon Connect. And there you get agent and supervisor interface, out of the box real-time monitoring and alerting, and it'll augment AWS by giving you different channels of contact like text, email, et cetera. Got it, great, sorry about that advance the slides too quickly. Um, no, this is awesome. I mean, again, th th this comes back to uh, the fact that, you know, I personally believe, and I think we're seeing it in the market that, you know, infrastructure as code is something people like to talk about. And there are certain areas of cloud where it's just very, um, uh, I don't know, apropos, easy to understand, easy to, to digest. I think there's tremendous power in, in having, um, you know, partners like you guys you know, leverage APIs. I talked about, you know, a little bit about Workspaces Core, but you've been doing this uh, now before even Workspaces Core was announced to help automate and to surface metrics and to, you know, make it easier for customers to manage, uh, whether that's on the EUC side or on the Connect side, which by the way, for folks who know, 
we're part of the same, we're sister organizations, so we're part of the same team within productivity apps here uh, at AWS. Uh, so we work very, very closely with our Connect counterparts. Um, and so it's not surprising to see that you guys have built uh, this impressive um, you know, practice around both uh, EUC technologies, workspaces and AppStream, as well as Connect. So sort of last piece here, and again, this is again, really why we wanted to have uh, you know, George here and, and provide some um, you know, sense of how this actually happens and works in the real world. There are a lot of migration support services that we provide as AWS uh, and that George and Cloudhesive and other EUC competency partners uh, provide uh, in conjunction with us. Um, and again, sort of, you know, the typical life cycle of how you probably think about, you know, complex technology projects, the assessment phase, the validation phase, both technically and business-wise, migration, you know, moving into, you know, full production and, and operation. So, you know, we offer immersion days. We do those, um, you know, together very often with, uh, with Cloudhesive. Um, POCs, so you can actually start to get your hands, um, you know, dirty with the technology and, and see how things would work, online training. Um, a lot of the TCO analysis, uh, we can help do, you know, to take the, the work that Yvonne and her team has done and bring it into practice, right? How would this TCO look in my environment, right? It's great that you have this composite organization and I understand sort of the, the more maybe generic use cases, but I need to understand how it's gonna work for me and my company because I have to present the use case to my boss. Uh, and then getting you know, beyond that, moving into actual migrations, how the, you know, the automation will work, uh, how the deployment will work, solution design, leveraging well-architected, um, as, as George mentioned, principles. Uh, and then finally, once you're operating, looking for areas where you can save money, right? Through cost op optimization, uh, uh, using tools like the workspace cost optimizer and other techniques that partners like um, uh, Cloudhesive have, you know, developed over time. Because as we like to say here at AWS, there's no substitute for experience, right? So, you know, George and team have just built uh, a lot of knowledge of how this stuff actually gets deployed, best practices. Um, so I'm not sure, George, maybe anything else to call out here? around uh, stuff you're seeing? Yeah, I, we can give our view on that. So yeah, this is definitely the way you'd want to do it, you know, from an enterprise view of, of the world. And kind of for what we see in a, a lot of customers is we will do our business validation earlier. You know, one of our abilities is that, you know, we have customers that are sometimes like really, they have a compelling event or they're focused on a single workload. So, you know, we have a full capability for everything presented on this slide, but except we're just not overly prescriptive on the order. We'll work with the customer on that. We might get a customer that's up against the clock or they're in a disaster and they need a quick response. So we might skip a few steps. It might be like, hey, will workspaces work for your use case? Okay, great. Here's what it's going to cost. Let's go. Uh, you know, kind of an important differentiator that I want to highlight is we have the ability to scale up and down given the customer technology. Uh, as an example, we did have one uh, customer in the education space and there was a big push during the pandemic. They had a downtime window, so to speak, during spring break and we had to get them all up and running in half a week, get them moved over to to these services and, and we work with them and we're able to successfully do a cut over right as classes started again and get folks online. Awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely. That great point on mentioning that this is sort of a, should be viewed as a, a menu at a fine, you know, dining establishment, right? You, you pick what makes sense for you. Uh, and then hopefully, uh, again, you know, customers make the, the smart decision to work with an EUC competency partner who can really help uh, them navigate, you know, what's required, what can you skip, uh, and ha how to be very agile and move quickly, uh, especially in, in cases where there isn't a lot of time. Uh, we did want to call out specifically MAP, uh, the Migration Acceleration Program. 
that hopefully, uh, if you're familiar with AWS uh, and, and have actually deployed services, you're familiar a little bit with MAP, you've either you know, you know, worked yourself directly with us or through a partner. Um, again, we, we, we can, this can be leveraged, um, these components, you know, some investment from us, specific migration methodologies, tooling, training, uh, and so on and so forth to help um, you know, give you that extra push, provide that extra momentum. So you don't feel as a customer that you're just, you know, okay, I'm sold on this. It's going to work for me. Now I got to, you know, create my AWS account and figure everything out. You know, absolutely not. You know, that, that's why we've got all of this infrastructure in place, both through uh, my team and as well as partners like George uh, to help uh, customers really accelerate. Um, so I think we're getting a little short on time here. Um, just want to you know power through the last few slides here. So again, you know our goal, you know holistically as AWS and as 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 partners uh, like Cloudhesive is really to help you get organized. You know, come up with the right architecture from the get go, so you're not going back and fixing things. You know, we to do that we provide access to specialists. Myself, I have uh, access to. Uh, a team of, of solution architects, but also partner very closely with um, folks like George and his team, you know, to really just bring all of the brain power early in the process, help set, set things up properly, you know, and then to be able to, you know, start migrations, get, get things done officially, make sure that you're, you're checking all the boxes from security and compliance perspective and a resiliency perspective. And then as we mentioned, you know, prior, also being able to optimize and to learn as things are going, right? This is, a lot of this is new, as much as we know a lot about server-based computing and how, a, you know, remote users interact with Windows and applications and, you know, how that stuff works. When you move to, uh, you know, uh, a cloud model, there are different things, you know, happening in the background and it's a learning process for many, many customers. So we're here to help make that as painless and as efficient as possible. Uh, and so, uh, you know, hopefully this is giving you a little bit of sort of, you know, momentum and energy to, you know, really sort of start digging into this. Um, again, we greatly appreciate the fact that George, uh, you know, gave us his time today. We so value their partnership. Uh, they are one of the leading EUC um, competency partners. There are others. Um, and so, um, again, you know, we like to provide choice here at AWS. Uh, it's all about flexibility and working within relationships that you may have. Um, so uh, there are certainly other partners uh, to choose from as well. So I think that about wraps it up. I know we just have a, a couple of minutes left. I'm not sure if there are any other questions. Many, many thanks to Yvonne for, for uh, taking those. I thought I was going to have time to sort of, you know, switch back and forth, but it never seems to work out that way. Um, so definitely read the, uh, the, the TEI impact report that Yvonne uh, and team um, authored with, uh, with Forrester. Super helpful. You know, we'll provide a lot of color and context on some of the high-level points that she shared. Uh, start a use case discovery session, right? I mean, start talking about it, right? And, and really sort of getting with your teams and, you know, brainstorming and figuring, you know, hey, you know, how could we use this stuff? Right, just doing that internally, getting the conversation started, is super important. And understanding where sort of the gotchas are, who's you know, who's sort of like you know, you know, holding on to the data, the on-prem solution, who's more open to a cloud solution, so you can sort of navigate the different personalities and the different teams. And then once you feel like you're in a good place, then yeah, engage with us, engage with Cloudhesive, with other uh, UC competency partners set up an immersion day workshop, you know, where we can come down and help you, uh, you know, and your teams, your technical teams understand how to, you know, you know, build workspaces, what's involved, you know, really getting sort of hands-on, uh, building up to, uh, you know, a, a you know, critical phase, which is PLC, you know, so you can get that technical validation that not only is it the right solution for you, but it works and you've proven it out. Um, and then hopefully on to production and, you know, uh, and to great things in the cloud. Um, the other thing that we can do again, as I mentioned, as you know, part of the business validation is uh, TCO analysis, where we take 
the principles from you know the TEI and other work that Yvonne's team has done and really apply them specifically to your uh, environment. So I think that's really about it. Um, I want to personally thank Yvonne and George for helping out here. Um, it's always great to have a team to present with. I've done so many of these in the past uh, and too many by myself where I feel I'm just like talking into my screen and it's so not fun. So thanks for, for keeping it um, uh, engaging and, and providing your areas of expertise. Uh, and for the audience, not sure if there are any final questions, but I think we have a minute or two where we can um, maybe take one or two um, last ones. Okay, so I see a question that just came in. It says, can you talk a little bit more about Workspaces Core that was announced last week? How is it fit into the portfolio and you know, how, how is it gonna help um, from an EUC uh, uh, perspective? So again, I, I, I'm super, super excited about Workspaces Core. I've already started sharing my thoughts on, on social. Um, to me, again, it comes back to, you know, the cloud needs to be programmatic. You don't just want to be using the cloud as another data center, which is why the whole notion of, you know, lifting and shifting an on-prem outdated solution to the cloud is okay, but not great. Right? It's never going to be great because you're not modernizing, you're not, you know, uh, changing the way that you do business. And so for, for me, and I think for the team, Workspace's core is really about exposing a set of, of public APIs so that partners like um, Cloudhesive can, can build solutions like Centricity to automate things and to expose metrics about workspaces and users and so on and so forth. Um, we use those types of, of um, APIs internally for our corporate workspaces solution to do provisioning and deprovisioning, self-service. Self-service is a huge area, uh, potential area of cost savings. If you can actually allow your end users to you know, say, hey, my workspace is not working, I want to restart it, or I'm a technical user and I'm using it to develop you know, software and I totally hose my machine, I want to rebuild my workspace. You don't want to have to have IT involved for all that. The way you get to that place is by leveraging um, uh, APIs. And so it's super exciting for us to have that now available as official offering. And, you know, the integration possibilities are really limitless. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, where we take that. So I think that's about it. We just are at the top of the hour, so I want to be conscious of everyone's time. Again, thank you so much to the panelists, to George and to Yvonne for joining, and thanks to you for taking the time. Um, if you have a colleague uh, or someone else who you think could benefit from this, we are going to make this available as an on-demand uh, webinar, so you know, you'll know you get some information. We'll follow up with you on how to access that. In the meantime, it is now is the time if you haven't done uh you know sort of anything in this area yet i strongly encourage you uh not just because gartner says so but because we're seeing sort of the momentum really pick up and uh, so now is the time to get comfortable with uh, you know cloud services understand cloud DAS, where you are in your journey uh and to uh and to uh you know take some decisive action to uh to get the process started so thanks again from me and from the panel and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Yvonne. Bye, everybody.